to your life. I love the intro. <laughs> Feels like a really uh, nice show. Let's continue from uh, last week, right? Uh, yeah. Uh, can somebody open to design a basic uh, P- a block diagram of the PCB for the Yakko sound. Yes. Uh, can somebody open that? Uh, somebody have it open. Can I? Um, Eric, I think you're most familiar with the tool. If I can find it, I'll try it. No, no. I have system preferences problems. Uh, there was a link, right? We could try to find from. There. Yeah, I've, I've got the link. I can show that probably. Josh are not joining today. He didn't say it, so assuming he would join. When somebody shares, and this is very nice, multiple people can share, but we only when we put it on the stream does it get uh, put on the stream. Hmm. So if you can have two of them ready and we can swap between them quickly. You know. So I'm able to share, but uh, I don't know anything about the tool or what you guys discussed last week. So one of you should probably share. So, uh, I, I think Eric, you're the most familiar with this tool. Okay, so I yeah, can share right away. I can't share without restarting this browser. So I think I remember what we were doing, though. I'm sorry, I'm just uh, finding the screen. Okay, here you go. I think you then have to click on it in the waiting area to make it show up. There we go. (laughs) (laughs) Is it visible now? Yeah. Yeah, so I think we left off kind of debating the relative merits of sort of this straightforward, you have a single lizard brain and you connect a bunch of peripherals to it versus a more decentralized and modular approach where everything is a brain. Kind of a multi-brain. Yes. The implication to me was that like each camera is effectively you could you could talk to it over a a serial line or like every, you would talk to everything over serial or everything over I2C over some protocol. Everything can be on a bus, as opposed to like turn on pin whatever in the in the single microcontroller. I think that's I, interesting. That seems extremely complicated. I will say, as somebody who's been through this specific rodeo, uh, if you want to have a robot this summer, this is not the way. <laughs> that was my fear as well. Yeah. 
Um, this is very, very um, challenging and expensive. And it's more work. And there's a lot of people that do this or try to do this. And when it works, it's beautiful. But like getting there is, is painful. Can you tell us a bit more why this is um, challenging? Because you're talking about multi-brains when like writing the firmware for one brain is going to be a project on its own as it is. And then updating that firmware from a server somewhere on a low bandwidth data link is a project on its own already. Like there's so much work to just get one brain working to lay out a PCB that has one brain to deal with all of the challenges of integrating a system that has one brain without having multiple brains and multiple buses and multiple different types of data buses and requirements and timing issues and the power to each node is different. And then switching the power on and off in a graceful way so it doesn't blow stuff up and crash the system. Like there, there's there's all kinds of of, of challenges here. Um, sure, like yes, a car, a modern car has hundreds of little sensors and nodules and computers, right? There's there's usually you know there's a lot they call them ECUs, right? So there's all these little nodes that exist in a car, um, and each one has its own firmware and its own design and its own standard and its own set of ways of accessing and interfacing with those standards and like can bus is very complicated on its own can open is very complicated on its own um the ethernet bus single pair ethernet's getting pretty popular on cars that's also its own can of worms so like this will just take multiple years if you if you want to go this route i'm like i'm serious it'll take multiple years to get it get it working gracefully This is strange because if we were to build it as separate components, uh, software components, I'll call it, you know, with a higher level um, electronics, then this would not be a multi year project. In other words, if each uh, micro, um, each thing here has a word controller next to it was, and I'm exaggerating severely, a Raspberry Pi, this would not take years or even months to do. It's my understanding that this is a system block diagram at the hardware level, not the software level. Absolutely. I'm, I'm trying to understand what are we doing wrong, which is making this a more difficult project. Having more than one of each thing. If you have more than one of like each thing, like any part on here that you could remove or consolidate for the first robot should be removed or consolidated. Like there should be absolutely nothing special bonus that will break, that will fail. It's harder to source. That's more pins to connect. Like it's got to be really simple. Because even then, it's going to break and not work. <laughs> so it's like everything about this robot will fail. And it will take multiple revisions for it to even, like, have a life. Then this is just how robots start. Like, I, this isn't, <laughs> I'm not making this up. Like, just ask anybody. <clears throat> um, there's actually a really interesting, I would recommend um, robotics specific um interview uh with with uh lex recently the um um the boston dynamics uh um ceo man I'm, I'm blanking on his name but he had a lot of really really interesting things to talk about especially on the history in the early days of boston dynamics and how it kind of grew out of the basement uh the leg lab in the basement and just like how big of a deal it was and a challenge it was to move the leg robot that was in the basement that had its own external power support system and external hydraulic pump and hydraulic cooling 
and computer like the computer wasn't bolted to the robot it was bolted to the floor and then there were some wires that ran to control the robot so like taking all of that stuff and like putting on a robot and making it mobile was absolutely insane and hard and it's unfortunately today there, it still is in a lot of cases like they cared so much about weight that they didn't put a muffler on the engine on the robot because they're like <laughs> we don't care if it's loud and, but if it weighs more, then everything on the whole robot gets more complicated and expensive, and you have to have a bigger radiator for the hydraulics. And so they literally didn't put a muffler on the engine because <laughs> it would weigh more. Because <laughs> it's like, so if you don't absolutely have to have it, get rid of it. Do we see, uh, Joshua, do you think there is a, a way? to start with the design on the left and to evolve it to the design on the right over time if we see it fits. Yes. I think a good example of this like centralized to decentralized system transition is um, the the early um, the really the really early uh, SpaceX rockets were run by one computer. Oh yeah. Okay. So like there was literally one expensive rad hard CPU that did everything. And that was it. Like there were not multiple computers and multiple things. It was just like one controller. Of course, over time, the rocket became more complex, bigger, physically more systems, more stuff. So yeah, like now it's, there's a lot, you know, it naturally progressed and there became multiple systems and controllers and computers on the thing. But in the beginning, it was just one thing. Yeah. That's, and in that, that case, like a lot it, of the, it was a rad, rad hardness was like a constraint. Um, but also it's just simpler when you only have to have one flight software instead of two flight softwares that are talking to each other and they have to talk to each other in a way where they're assuming that the communication link between them can get cut at any point in time and then you have the byzantine um there's a uh there's a two generals problem if you've heard of this in communication so like three, three yeah 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 oh, so sorry. yeah 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 you know you know what we're talking about but it's like the second you have multiple controllers that problem is a problem that you start to have to think about so it's just like fewer things, fewer issues. But it, yeah, definitely over time, it will progress. I wonder so, how much of that progression with SpaceX is a, is a function of organization size. Like, does it start to be easier to work on a separate computer just because the team is large and you don't want to all be working on the same thing? So Conway's law as implemented in hardware. Yeah, but then you need to have people who are like, militant about the system boundary and the system interface because you have to have people that are like we have to define an interface that's the other thing that'll happen like it, we have these con multiple controllers they have to have a standard language that they talk to each other with and that's always invariably i mean even as i think there's been projects here that it's clear that that be, that's like a whole thing on its own it's protocol definition and this is like low level protocol definition in the hardware that deals with things like bad packets, noise, retries, collision detection, um, which, which are all, you know, kind of the garden variety issues you have in a bus like this. But um, yeah, like it's really interesting stuff. I'm just saying like it's a cool thing to work on. It, it will just take immense amounts of time and resources. When I watched a little bit of this video tutorial about integrating a microcontroller into your own custom PCB, it became very clear that developing a whole bunch of PCBs that are going to interact with each other or with a whole bunch of different microcontrollers is just, yeah, a very scary proposition. Unless you're somehow able to reuse the exact same design over and over and over again. But even then, you've just got like tons of components.
But like, do uh, whatever happened with the um, the flux competition? What was the thought there to actually try laying out a board? Yeah, I think this was still kind of on that path, right? Of just just trying to figure out what the components were actually going to be. This was our this is our step one. Yeah. So g given given the um, let's say the, the team experience, uh, why don't we start first with the uh, the standard dual brain uh, design and uh, refine it uh, so that we can maybe move to flux or something like that? Uh? Uh, my understanding is that uh, here on um, on this tool we are. We are first uh, a bit informally uh, laying out the different uh, components. And uh, once we have a good idea of the, the coverage and so on, then we move to Flux, where we uh, will be, we should be able to, uh, to do the next steps basically toward uh, the actual PCB design, right? Yeah, I mean, this is certainly very low uh, granularity. Uh, so, we might want to just talk about what we, I mean, we obviously threw this together really fast during last, the last week's session. So uh, maybe we should talk about whether we, what we think these components actually are, how they're like, I don't know. Do we need to dive into detail of like what connects these components together and do we have the right components? Are we missing something? Yeah. Joshua, does this uh, sound like a constructive approach? Uh, the, the, if, this, if this, yeah. yeah, I mean, if the system block diagram captures all of the components necessary to complete the mission, then there is a certain level of completeness that we've reached, and then selecting specific components would certainly be a good a good next step because ultimately what the task they're performing now is conversion of this into an actual PCB. And we could also okay. consider so, whether there's anything we should eliminate for simplicity slash iteration one uh, purposes. Like for fun, yeah. I drew two cameras on there. Cause I was like, Hey, let's have one in the front, one in the back. Uh, that might be useful for the mission. It may not, but if we eliminate one, that reduces complexity a little bit. Uh, I have right. no idea what stuff we actually need for providing power and charging via a solar panel. Yeah, components that don't exist don't fail. It's a nice property. Yeah. <laughs> that too. Yeah, and then like the big brain and load switch thing, like that's a very cool like architectural direction, but I bet we could do a version one without it and then talk about adding a Raspberry Pi on top later. Uh, what about we start by reviewing this part of the graph because uh, Venkat was not here last week. And so uh, we go through the different uh, pieces and uh, at the same time, we, uh, we flag them. We flag them for, uh, we keep them or we don't keep them for now, mm -hmm. whatever. Yeah, but because I- Basically, uh, yeah, P I, I, please. I, I, sorry, sorry, please continue. Oh, no, no, so, so, sorry. I, uh, I was saying, please, uh, please go ahead. <laughs> sorry. Uh, okay, I, I just wanted to say about what uh, Vet said. Uh, everything is correct except for the issue of lizard vein, big vein, and load switch. If the goal is to make a PCB, we can buy a PCB with a ESP and a motor controller and add to it a battery charger. Uh, one of the things we wanted to do was to make something unique, you know? So I, I don't want to give up the lizard vein, big vein switch. Otherwise, with, it's an interesting exercise, but not anything special. Okay, so I, I so just... Personally, I, I agree. At the, same time, at the same time, I'm also a proponent of starting smaller so that we uh, maybe we have an opportunity to see the whole cycle uh, you know up to the pcb up to the point where we can push a button to order for the pcb even mm -hmm. if we don't want and after iterate okay so for example uh, 
Um, um, it seems that uh, it seems this architecture for me, I see it more as a subsumption architecture, where uh, the uh, there are low level um, layers, okay, covered by the lizard brain, and higher level layers covered by the big brain. But uh, one property that uh, this can be built iteratively, which is a good property in uh, in such kind of design, uh, given the personally given my knowledge on PCV design, basically. Okay, so. Uh, you know, it could be a small one map where first we have a subset of what we see here. So one camera, one motor, only the lizard brain, okay? And uh, try to go through the, this uh, to the end, okay? To the PCB design as a practice. And the next step would be to add uh, a bit more complexity. And so, for example, to add uh, the big brain without load switch. And after we add the load switch, for example, The other tricky part for iterating I, I was thinking about was like, so on the diagram, the comm system is talking to the lizard brain. The cameras are talking to the lizard, everything's talking to the lizard brain. If instead we wanted comms and the big brain connected to each other, because we thought that would be easier to communicate through a big brain than through a lizard brain, then that would be pretty fun, a pretty fundamental distinction in the architecture. How often do we want to communicate with the rover? That would decide, right? Also, you... resilience would be the question of like, if if we can't boot up the big brain because we never get enough solar power, we never get enough battery power, then we would never be able to communicate with it. Then nobody will know. And no one will know. <laughs> <laughs> All right, are you are you implying that the big brain needs to be online to communicate with the robot? Or I didn't quite understand. I'm saying yes. that that's no, the decision like, uh, we have to choose. I mean with the base station, like let's say we are running a base station somewhere in Israel, Finland or something. So how often do we, we need to know where the rover is? It's the external communication, not the big brain communication. If oh, it's wait, not is that your base station? So you'll have to monitor it somewhere, right? I thought that is the mission that we are able to monitor it from somewhere. Yeah, but I thought we we're going to use cellular. Yes, That's from somewhere. But like, but how often from cellular? If it's not that often, we can just connect the four uh, G uh, modem to the big brain, and that's then just turn it on when we want. So that is one way to do it. Y yeah, I mean, I will say if if. Uh, you do want to use the um, the little blues uh, edge edge to cloud module. Uh, that that will that little thing does a good job of power consumption. So like it consumes maybe seven microamps when it's asleep, and then every cellular sync is gonna it it, it depends on a lot of things. But let's say it's it again. <laughs> I guess this is a recorded call. I I don't like I can't give specific numbers, but it's like really good. It's not that many joules to do a cellular transaction. So you say, hey modem, wake up and send this data to a server and back. It's very it's very conservative. It's not much data at all. Not much power. Sorry at all. But is that, that is like narrow band the... IoT, right? Like if you are using a modem which connects to normal cellular, uh, which is using broadband. Uh, that will probably take more. Um, I mean, any of these modems, you can run, like you can leave them totally on and connected to the to the tower at all times, or you can run them in this intermittent mode. So it, this is certainly an open question. It's like, how does the rover need to operate? Or does it switch between discontinuous and a continuous mode of connection? So one um, way to sort of, I guess, calibrate the capacity of this link is, if the rover is taking something heavy like video footage and like recording, say, hours of footage per day, uh, and then you kind of just stopped and did nothing but transmit all the video footage um, over the internet to home, like um, how long would that last before you either exhausted bandwidth or power? Like, is that a, mean a meaningful limit to think about? Like the actual quantity of stuff you're putting back through telemetry? Yeah, I, I mean, I think as like sort of a rough order of magnitude calibration, um, 
keep in mind there's there's a number of like IoT data plans and they are on the order of it's usually like 500 megabytes to a gigabyte of data and that data is good for around five to ten years so it's on the order of roughly 100 megabytes per year 50 to 100 megabytes per year of data is sort of what these these things are kind of calibrated around in terms of um like a correlation between um time and amount of data consumed and that keep in mind that that data allowance counts for either going up or down. So like if okay. you send a megabyte so, up and a megabyte down, it's two megabytes. So if you use this for video, you'd use it up in like five minutes, like a year's allowance in five minutes, right? Uh, this depends greatly on the quality of the video. So like I'll I'll give you yeah. an example. Um, uh, there's a company around here that makes a um, a robot that you swallow. It's called it's called the Pillbot. Um, it's, the company's called Indiatix, I believe. But anyway, like when the pill robot is actually in your stomach, like getting driven around, because it has like a little remote control, so you can kind of like it has little thrusters and it can move around in your stomach. Um, they like hardcore compress the video because the, the wireless length from inside your body is extremely low bandwidth. It's like a very, very low frequency radio. And so they have to like really, really compress it. And if you can hear the drums, I'm sorry, but I think my neighbor's uh... <laughs> background music. <laughs> no, but we don't have to use narrow band, right? We can use broadband. So this have you used? So I have one of these at home. So I, when I travel, I use this just more modem for my laptop. So we could connect one of these to the uh, Raspberry Pi. Uh, this provides like a full 4G broadband internet. Yeah, I wonder if thinking about this from an IoT perspective is like the wrong one because we actually don't need to run it for a low cost over years. But we're looking at like, well, we could pay a reasonable amount of money over a yeah, and this, at usable. least in Finland, it, for seven dollars, it gives me unlimited uh, three hundred Mbps for one week, and for thirty euros, I think it will be like uh, for one month, unlimited three hundred Mbps. Do these regular broadband uh, cellular um, modems uh, are they more power hungry than the narrowband IoT ones? Yeah, yeah, probably yes, but like I was just trying to check how much. Uh, of how much current does it consume, but I haven't found any like details of it. So I, I do need to, we need to, so the notion between like wide band and narrow band that exists everywhere. Also in IOT modems. So keep in mind, like it's not about the wireless technology. It's about like the, how you actually perform the transaction with, with the cloud. Um, this is this is the thing I don't think we've we've mentioned so far. Like, if you want to have like a full data plan, let's say, that needs to be associated with like a person's account, and that is a lot of drama. I can tell you, so somebody here will need to like own the SIM card that's associated with the robot, and that will be drama, like a lot of drama. The nice wow. thing about a lot of these like IoT plans is it, it can be like an account that it's not as it's a bit more nebulous, right? It doesn't have to be like a person's in key subscription. Um, because most of these modules come with a, a SIM card or you can buy the SIM cards in bulk. So like they and they're like pre and they're prepaid. Yep. And so we're talking about the difference between like a real data plan is one associated with person. They're going to be on the hook if they use too much data or something. Yeah, I'm. I'm just. I'm like. It's not to say that. Um, like, for instance, if we have a Blue's wireless account, that it wouldn't be associated with somebody or an organization. And I guess we kind of need to talk about that as well. As like, how does the Yak project deal with that? But um, yeah, like if you are subscribing to a data plan with AT and T, like that is a thing that, and especially if it's a business account, there's all kinds of drama surrounding it it's like a lot there are no prepaid uh, data plans there or what there should be right 
Depends it, on the country, I guess, huh? Okay. It, it depends on, yeah, a lot of stuff. So um, one common thing is I'll share it's uh, once. But that's, again, it's like an IoT. It's like 500 megs for 10 years. Um, this, this SIM card. But if you want to have, like, a data plan from Vodafone or Verizon or AT&T and whatever, like, somebody here has to open an account or because I is I don't I don't think yeah collective is there like a or an entity nope okay so no, yeah, but, an individual what, what is the the drama is the drama that you have to guarantee that you'll pay if you use too much I mean here I just buy a sim card and no. in my name that's fine and you know if I go over my one gig a month or whatever the number might be, you know, that's it. It goes down to one mega an hour. We might have a war on drugs thing here. I recently <laughs> had a we had a no, project. Have a name, you know. We had a project where we needed an AT and T SIM card for unlimited data. And um do you open a business account with AT and T? They they want like a thousand dollars and they keep it for a year. They're like, we're taking this thousand dollars and keeping it for a year. We'll give it back to you at the end of the year. That's just what yeah, we do. But a private card, not a business card. No, this is this is for this is a business account specifically. Had this requirement. Yeah, but why do we need a business account? We're not a business. We're just five individuals. But this so is kind of like project. to help with the project being like more widely applicable or for it to be open source because it's like who owns these rovers right there's going to be this sort of question like i'm just saying it's easier to maybe have a sponsorship from once or blues wireless that allows like you know these sort of data collection rovers or i don't know that maybe you see what i'm saying like somebody here has to deal with the sim cards Unless we go yeah, with one buy of that drama. Yeah, somebody buys a SIM card. Joshua buys a SIM card. Why, why is it a drama? That, that's what I don't understand. If we buy a prepaid SIM card, it's very easy. Because it's all yeah. an upfront cost. I okay. personally do not want to buy 10 new SIM cards on my AT&T account for this project. I don't know about anybody else here, but that's not... You, that's you not wouldn't happened. be buying 10, you'd only be buying one. Each person who builds a yak or sow will buy his own SIM card. What right, yes. I suppose so. We could we could do that. You you're not manufacturing ten yak or sows. Why not? You personally only manufacturing one. Maybe I want to make ten. Maybe that's more interesting. <laughs> well, in that case, find ten thousand dollars and buy ten prepay, you know, ten business accounts. <laughs> and like even prepaid like should be cheap, right? Like thirty bucks, right, for one month unlimited, or maybe maximum it might be fifty in the US. That doesn't I don't know. sound cheap. I'm also not understanding why you think it's drama, Yasha. Because uh, have you been part of projects where it became like a political thing and people were like fighting over who pays for the bills or something? Because this is such a small scale project, I don't see that being an issue. I'm saying, yes, yeah. Sorry, yeah, I'd yeah, like I'm to just... add. I, I'd like to add that, for example, for four G modules, okay. Uh, for example, Europe and Japan are not compatible with the US. Okay, so the thing is that uh, uh, if you have your SIM card, uh, I can't use it. Okay, I can't use the account uh, here, for example. And that's what? not new. It was uh, the same with three G, the same with two G, and even before. No, but the um, OG modem, USB modem should be compatible everywhere, right? No, the uh, SIM cards are not compatible. The ONCE card is part of Dutch Telecom, and I believe Japan is in their supported countries, no problem. And I think, I will double check this, but I believe Blues Wireless also supports Japan on their global SKU. So it's a world it's a world eSIM and uh, world frequencies supported by the hardware. Okay, so the uh, I think last year I bought uh, 4G hats for the Raspberry Pi, okay? 
And the thing is that uh, I had to order uh, at least two models, one for the UK and one for Japan, and they were not compatible. I, I, I needed different SIM cards as well. Okay. So either they, uh, I was, uh, uh, they, just, they just got me, okay? Um, but apparently even uh, so some, uh, some components have different reference numbers and stuff like that. So I understood that, that there was something happening there. That, that's part of what I mean is like cellular is so complicated. I can't even, I deal with it a lot lately and I still probably am only scratching the surface. Um, but like, I do know once specifically their SIM card works in both Japan. You can look at their coverage. It works in Japan, it works in the U S works in the UK. Why, um, why, why does that matter? I mean, I'm not going to send the Yako cell underwater from, uh, the West Coast to Japan. There's going to be one Yakosau in the U.S., one in Japan. Uh, oh, so I'm sorry, thinking... sorry, Mayer. Oh, the reason why I thought it would matter is because that's uh, for me. That's one of the reasons why I don't understand the drama, the the potential drama. Because uh, from my perspective, because of that, I thought that anyway we can't share the we can't share the SIM card and stuff like that. I would expect the drama comes because we have a competition on resource or whatever. Basically, if that's and uh, uh, the understanding or yeah, yeah i think i'm failing to articulate the challenge the, the first <laughs> challenge is exactly what you're saying eric like depending on the type of account that you have if you're going to have like a personal consumer wireless account the global roaming may not be incorporated into that and that is one layer of drama that you're going to be adding having a personal wireless account on a robot the second piece is um Okay. It it's a barrier to entry for other people to get into the project if they have to have a wireless account. Like right now, we could buy these one once SIM cards and we could all build a rover in our house and it would connect to the cell tower. Because they've done a lot of effort and drama to make it connect to the cell tower in every country. Um and we don't have to have people opening accounts for that. So that's what I'm saying. Like if, if somebody wants to build their own rover and if part of the barrier to entry is having their own wireless account, that's a barrier to entry. Like, why do we need to have that versus just buying a card from Blue's Wireless that just works? Like it's very, very, very low barrier to entry versus having your own personal wireless account that's then associated with a robot. By the way, if you call AT&T and tell them the SIM card is in a robot and they try to give you a text message to recover and verify you own the, the SIM card, and then the robot can't read the text message. I've been there. It's really it's problems. <laughs> Do they uh, specifically like? Is there specific uh, limitations on like you're not allowed to put a SIM card in a random device that you've built? <laughs> That's not a I mean, phone. Like, I don't know. It's like, can I buy this fifteen dollar a month Boost Booth Wireless prepaid data pl plan? And does that actually? Do, do they deliver me a SIM card and I can plug it into a piece of hardware? Or is this like... Uh, you can try, yeah. and it it depends. It really depends. And like I said, the other angle is like, depending on if the carrier understands that it's being used in an industrial application that's not a cell phone. Like, I'm, I'm, this literally was an issue. Like, a lot of these... This is this is also a project where we had a it was it was literally a thousand dollar like rugged cell modem like very fancy hardware and uh, yeah local carrier like couldn't verify that the sim was held by an account and it needed to have a text number like an SMS sent to it to recover <laughs> the account <laughs> verification. And so we had to like take apart the hardware to like dig out the SIM card, and it, it's just a whole. <laughs> it's 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 a, it's a it's there's drama, I'm telling you. So what's not drama is the blue snow card because you get it, you plug it in, and it just works. So and you're saying works. if we can come up with a mission that works. At a, on a very low bandwidth, low communication uh, environment, 
we would uh, get a lot of advantages. Yes, and I would also go so far as to say that it would be a great emulation for the real mission. Because if you look at the actual data link budget on Mars today, I would bet you, because I don't know off the top of my head, but I bet you it'd be somewhat similar to some of the stuff we're talking about. Like gigabyte per year kind of a level. Um, not like tens or hundreds of gigabytes, but I think I presented on that and I already can't, I've already forgotten what it was, but yes, it's very limited. Yeah. So yeah, we should get good at data compression because that's like a valuable <laughs> thing to do for a real mission. You can, you can get pretty far with stills. Like just still images as opposed to video. Oh, okay. Like you don't have quite the interactivity level of a you're driving over a cell link, but you can say, okay, here's what it looks like right now. Type in some instructions, wait a few minutes, see what the result was, which was kind of the model of what my first rover was. For more arbitrary reasons, but yeah, this has this has good reasons. Uh, but based on uh, what we've discussed today, can we see some kind of increment we can do on the design? You know, in the the ten last minutes for 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 today, because we basically today we mainly talked about the the communication system here, right? Um, can we refine this box? Uh, uh, or maybe maybe a question to Joshua is that uh, how can we step forward toward uh, maybe toward flux or um, I understand that we are going we are trying to to get ready to enter flux. Any suggestion next, on what we could uh, increment on? The next step is to pick the parts because to begin the design in flux, one of the first steps will be to build a library or bring the components into the ECAD, ECAD tool, electrical design tool. So for instance, mm -hmm. if we were to use, for instance, for the lizard brain, an ESP module, I'm sure that's already in the library, but we need to verify that. And we'd get the schematic going with the module. Uh, and then for the big brain, let's say this is Raspberry Pi. We would also need to make sure that there's the header uh, sort of like laid out and in the schematic so we can wire it up. So pick all the parts, create a library of those parts in the ECAD tool, and then we can begin the layout of the board. Schematic capture, finalizing schematic capture, layout, and then produce the board. Just to give a quick uh, summary of the video I dropped in Discord where it kind of goes through a PCB board, like design kind of thing, or I've only watched it through the schematic stage, but this is using KiCad, not um, Flux or whatever, but like just with the chip, <laughs> you have to like follow the manufacturer's like data sheet or whatever to figure out how many capacitors you got to throw in on the power to go into the chip. You've got to pick which pins you're going to use for which peripherals. Like you want to hook it up to USB so that you can program the thing over USB. You have to like choose which lines you're going to use for that and figure out exactly what USB adapter you're going to use to connect it to. And lots of little itty bitty details like that. Some pins need to be tied like up. Sometimes need to go down. Sometimes need to be on a resistor. Like there's lots of little things like that. So one thing that is kind of nice about the way we're doing this and one thing we could do is actually Again, it depends on the components that are chosen, but we could do one unit in a breadboard form just to make sure things kind of check out. Um, it would also be very valid to just design the board and leapfrog and go straight to a board. That's super valid here. Um, the, the really big advantage, though, of the components that we're picking that are, like, off the shelf from Adafruit and Sparkfront is, like, to your saying, Rhett, and again, this is not engineering advice, but um, 
one thing that you can do is Adafruit uh, has all of her schematics completely out in the open. So, for instance, if you're building a project with a bunch of her modules, you can look at her schematics and then basically just copy and paste what she did for the capacitors, for the passive network, for all like all this stuff, all that stuff. You can just use it as a reference design. And then all you're you're doing kind of ultimately is just connecting the modules together with wires on the screen instead of wires on the on on the yeah. So again, that's not engineering advice. <laughs> not everything that she designs is like I would say it's good for production, but in terms of this, it's great because it's it shows you all that stuff. It's funny so, that the the guy who made this video had a very similar disclaimer and it was like now this isn't exactly right. But it's close enough to like work. <laughs> like what? <laughs> what are you talking about? Like it's like, well, we're skipping over a lot of little details about EM interference and I don't know. Yeah. As an aside, I'm I'm um, trying out a AI uh, schematic capture tool called Circuit Mine next month. Pretty excited about that. I'm uh, gonna try to do some real work with it, and it goes from like this what we see here, this system block diagram, and it generates a complete schematic. So uh, let's do the other one. If we're having the AI do it, let's give it the difficult part, difficult design, not the easy design. That could potentially be interesting. Um, yeah, that could potentially be interesting. Keep... This is a very expensive tool, by the way. So unfortunately, oh. it's not. Yeah. <laughs> Very expensive, yeah. <laughs> Very. <laughs> but otherwise, yeah, it'd be really fun. Yeah, I mean, I mean, maybe you know, maybe maybe you could try running this through there, see what it spits out, see how similar it is to. To, to what? maybe they would be interested in some stress testing uh, uh, project. Yeah, keep in mind this is only I think two weeks old. Flux has some kind of like AI assistant thing. Yeah, tool. I asked it how to like integrate an H bridge into a USB 32 and it gave me a bunch of instructions. So I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it's not engineering advice, but maybe <laughs> <laughs> it didn't it didn't do it for me, and that's what I wanted to just draw the lines. Ah. <laughs> but yeah, pick components and then everything else will flow. That's kind of the next step. Uh, but personally, I'd be curious, you know, to uh, to even have maybe a dumbed down version of uh, this diagram, and uh, go the whole way, you know, through the the through the, the pipeline, you know, uh, with flux and so on, and uh, to the point where we have some kind of uh, PCB that looks like it would work basically, and iterate on that. Personally, I'd, I'd like that, and uh, I'd like to. Uh, I see it as a valuable, you know, a step forward. Okay. Uh, but what do you think? Because, to, because yes, last week uh, it was uh, pretty exciting, and uh, there was uh, it felt like we uh, we made a, we made a good step forward. Uh, and uh, the, this week, uh, the discussion was very valuable. But it was my understanding that we we basically talked about uh, how to make this uh, the communication system. Okay? But no, uh, I'm not. Quite, I'm not so, so sure how to uh, refine this diagram based on the discussion today. It seems to me that this communication system should be uh, uh, either a, a chip name or whatever, or it should be broken down into uh, other pieces to uh, to cover communication. Is this an yeah, increment well we can do in five minutes? In this specific case, what we need to do is label what the lines are. Because it's like these are different buses, essentially. So, like, the, the connections themselves need to be specified. And then, yeah, so, like, the communications. Where is the link in the... Is there a link to the... I dropped it in the private chat in the StreamYard originally at the top. Oh, it doesn't, it's not, um, I joined after you sent it, so I didn't receive it. Oh. Uh, let's see. 
Oh, so it doesn't share the history. Oh. Interesting. Got it. That's pretty standard for these sort of ephemeral meeting systems, right? Yeah. So, like, this is spy, right? Okay, I started to modify a, a, a version of that, that one under uh, under the... Uh, Joshua, if you're editing now the, the one on top... Uh, oh, 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 okay. okay. So, so, sorry, I... I just copy pasted uh, down a uh, bit down the the, the screen okay? uh, to to keep the version on top uh, unedited because that's what we did last week. And uh, oh, okay, sorry. So, Red, you were mentioning that uh, maybe we could simplify the design by having only one camera. Is this something we would like to do? My since, since one camera is good enough. Yeah. Yeah, my gut says yeah. But I also am curious what the iteration process is like. Like, do we learn a lot and then before actually building something, come back through and say, what else do we want to add? Because I think we also had other uh you know, hand wavy mission questions like, do we want some other sensors? Do we want like Yeah. What do we, what do, what do we want to have connected to it? And so, but it'd be nice to like defer to me it would be nice to defer that with the idea that oh it'll be easy to come back in later and reevaluate things once we we want to add stuff but i i'm a little bit nervous about that based on uh unfamiliarity with schematics and fear of electrical engineering <laughs> how i learned to love the bomb driven by fear <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, I think there's a lot to be said for like, let's do the simplest possible, simplest possible thing. It will probably not work the first set of stuff that comes in. And that is completely normal. Yeah, the first version <laughs> won't work, so we should probably have to do the least amount of things possible. So this is like I'm just trying to do kind of a little speed run here. And these arrows really want to not have the thing on the end. I forget an Excalibur. How do you get rid of that? Is this line something that we keep the, the DC regulated feed into the motor controller? No, and this wants to be this wants to be really big, like this big, because there's a lot of sensors that are going to stick next to it. Do we need extra flash oh. memory? This means bulk storage, right? Like SD card? Yeah, if we are storing the uh, camera images somewhere, that was just extra memory for it. Especially if you don't have uh, communication all the time. So this is the load switch for the big brain. I see. So the big brain goes up here. Well, maybe it'd probably be easier to show it like this, so you can see the. All right, whoops. Do we need the stereo camera for the mission? Uh, Not necessarily. That was, uh, mm. Yes. And I think Red was mentioning a front and back camera, so it was not even stereo. It was just like, why is it that the rover won't move forward? 
I can't see it. But it's a lot easier to draw two circles than to wire up two cameras. So then kind of the, the other thing we need is this is like GPI, this is GPIO. This is SD card is also spy. And then we're going to need GPIO for the chip select, right? Because are you all familiar with I2C being a um, multi, you can have multiple nodes on the same bus, whereas with SPI, you can only have one thing talking at a time. So you have to have the chip select. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. I remember thinking, wow, SPI is really annoying. It uses all my pens. Uh, yeah, but it's like mm -hmm. way higher. The motor is like underneath. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. Send back water. And this is also probably, I don't know. The one thing that is very risky about this I2C, um, so what can happen, uh, we will just have to, I think that should just be like a UART, like serial connection. Um, UART is probably worse. So um, ITC requires pull-up resistors. And what can happen is if you turn the big brain off, the pins that the pull-up resistors are connected to is, um, are pulled up. So then the big brain will draw power like phantom power for no reason. Um, it, so I, this dotted line is just a risk of phantom power draw. Hmm. Is kind of what I'm getting at. So this is something we have to watch out for in the design is if we want to turn off the big brain, we need to make sure the big brain is really genuinely off. Um, otherwise, it might be secretly consuming all of our juice. So this is now kind of in a form where we see the main power paths. We see the main system components. And then we just need to kind of define um, the specific part numbers for all of these things. Because then that'll be that'll right. convert into a library. Oh, and the microphone is kind of an interesting one. The microphone is potentially really hard. What, why so? <clears throat> because microphones produce a lot of data. So, the the I two C bus can usually go up to. Okay. I think one megabit. So is, is there a chip that knows how to uh, take audio data and put it on the bus at a low rate or whatever? Um, a very made chip. A very made chip. That's what I'm saying. That potentially, and if so, we would want to incorporate it into the, the, the system block diagram. Yeah. In other words, it's not, it might be a mini brain, but it's a standard component. We're not developing anything there. Sure. Yeah. I mean, if you want to consider like an off the shelf chip, uh, um, uh, yeah. mini brain. Yeah, that's, that's true. Yeah.
So here one question. Sorry, one question. Once we have such kind of diagram, do we know anything about uh, power budgets? Because we are talking a lot about, about that, you know, that uh, what we can do deep for the mission, what power do we have? And so here there is a solar and battery and so on, but uh, do we have any idea about the feasibility, feasibility of what we have here in terms of power, for example? Yeah, so yeah, 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 that comes back to the mission. Okay. Seems like weight and motors is going to be the dominating factor. One thing that right? could be fun is to take the system block diagram and then resize everything given its properties, such as weight or power consumption. That's kind of a. So, uh, like, if we were yeah. to do that here, this would be like this. So. The big brain being on is like a huge, huge power True. drop. Yes. All right. Well, the next step could be just trying to find out a rough uh, numbers for all of them and then type it here. And then. Yeah, or it could be in, a, in, in the um, in the, uh, the, the spreadsheet. Ex yeah. Another question. I think last week we were talking about, for example, the Lisa brain telling a camera, to, you know, to to capture, and the camera to uh, to write the uh, the pixel array directly to the to the SD card, okay, to the bulk storage. Yes. And um, one of the reasons we were talking about that last week is because. Uh, um, we are saying, for example, okay, the sensor, so the camera here just uh, captures data, okay, on demand, uh, put the, put it directly into memory, so they, uh, we need the line basically, but at least there is, uh, it doesn't go through the Lisa brain, and at some point, for example, the big brain just access directly the SD card, uh, so that it can do some some processing like object recognition or something like that. Is it something that uh, we see on this diagram, or, or is it something we need to uh, we need to modify something to have that? I mean, the, the current this current is this is very much a um, sort of an electrical system block diagram, so it might not capture some of these other elements that we care about. Okay, and that comes at a later stage. Inside the flex pipeline, for example. It, I mean, there's, there's no. If there are things that we know about the system, if there's sort of known knowns. It it always helps for that to be captured, somewhere. Mm -hmm. This is the question. So these these are uh, dotted. Um, do we need encoder feedback from the motor to know? If we have wheel slippage, if we're stuck, you know, this is part of the mission. So these are encoder, maybe. I've been really wanting that on my current that rover projects and been unable to quite crack that one. So doesn't that go through the motor controller? Can't it go through the motor controller? That, that depends. It totally what depends on. What's the easier to do? No, I, I understand. What's easier to design? If there's an off-the-shelf motor controller, which gracefully does this, it's less wires electrically to have an integrated motor controller. Okay, the downside of that, though, is mm -hmm. your software stack then is dependent on that particular semiconductor. The nice thing about the encoders going directly into the microcontroller is that's very, like, low level hard to hard to mess up because then you're no longer married to a particular chip you're directly reading from the encoders and then you just need an h bridge which is a kind of a dumb device you can use any old h bridge to control your brush motors 
So, so it's a, it's a trade-off that uh, we can uh, we can just settle on, basically depending on the mission and stuff like that. Well, we keep on pushing more functionality into the lizard brain. At some point, it'll be too difficult to write the software for it. Mm. I guess that's part of the decision process on the on this question, right? Because uh, maybe with there is a motor controller that exists that does that, but then the budget uh, is much higher, for example. Yeah, well, we're not keeping track of the complexities that we're forcing onto the lizard brain. The complexity includes, you know, memory and processing, but also some type of real-time responsiveness. So mm -hmm. probably at the very least, you need a buffer between the encoder and the lizard brain. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, all these things can be done with the uh, ESP. <laughs> yeah. I, I would say, like, the nice thing about firmware is you can write it later. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll have a robot in two months, but it won't be able to move because it'll take two years to write the firmware. But it's just an yeah. over there update away from moving. <laughs> <laughs> Deploy it and ship the software later. <laughs> and if you drop it out of a helicopter, it moves really, really fast. I've done this more than I care to admit. You ship the client the hardware, and they're like, why isn't it working? It's like, oh, wait, send. Oh, there, it's working. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. <laughs> so, yeah, th this is like, yeah, I, I think there's just... You know, uh, we need to pick some pick some parts. Uh, Great. I think uh, I briefly shared. I I picked like a skeleton robot. Um, I I'll share the part numbers for the motor controller later. Um, but yeah, that was kind of how I was. Like to on Roger's point, like this is something the ESP can do. It, it, it's very capable of reading the encoders. So I'll share my suggested controller, and then yeah, if if somebody has a better controller, yeah, definitely find can find one that's better. Uh, please, because I'm not sure what to choose from. So anyway, <laughs> what is the ULS? Ultrasonic. Oh. Hmm. Is it okay that it uh, may not be the most weatherproof? Is it is it facing downward or uh, forward? Forward. Hmm. It's gonna get wet, dusty. Dusty maybe, but not wet in the Mojave deserts. <laughs> when it rains, it pours. Uh, there oh, yeah. are. There are ultrasonic sensors. Um, you know, it's funny when the when Tesla showed off the Falcon doors, everybody was like, "Oh, wow, that's cool! It moves really cool." But the thing that I was like, "Whoa, that's really impressive!" is they tuned their ultrasonic distance sensors to go straight through the aluminum door panel. That was really. I was like, "Whoa, <laughs> that's the thing!" So they actually have ultrasonic distance sensors behind that aluminum sheet, and they just like tuned it right so it goes through. The door um uh but so you can get sealed ultrasonic distance sensors they're fancier but if we do need a sealed against it, at least dust um sensor then yeah that's something we would need to pick for sure the mic is also an inherent existential like hard part there's no good answer for the mic. I, that's something I. There's something I could just suggest off the top of my head. Maybe we need to split up some of our components into uh, stages of desirability. Of hmm. Not so desirability. It's more like uh, life changingness. So I understand the mic is a life changing component. It is. Part of the reason for the mic being life changing is um, and for any keep in mind for any of these components. In an ideal world, the lizard brain can go into deep, deep 
a deep slumber. And maybe something, some event happens where it needs to wake up. The microphone in particular is extra super hard to figure out. Because, like, when you're sleeping, you're not listening. And you don't know if you should be... Because if you hear something where you should wake up, you won't be listening, so you won't know to wake up. Yeah, but I, I, I've seen a solution for that where what you do is you look at certain frequencies which indicate that something interesting is happening, and you can do that in some very basic low-powered hardware. I'd love to see that part, if you have a, a part that does that well. That'd be really cool. I, mean, I don't know yeah. if it's a part. You know, I, I deal in boxes connected with lines. But, uh, yeah, I, I think it's an actual product. Let me... Yeah, there's this one product that's kind of interesting if, if anybody here is into birds. But it's uh, it's more or less a Raspberry Pi with a big microphone on it. And um, it classifies bird songs. And then just, like, records the timestamp. So it's this sort of the... Uh, this is um, It's kind of a science ornithological research product as well. If you can contribute your bird call data from your backyard uh, to kind of track birds around. But that requires a Raspberry Pi that's connected to wall power because it crunch, it's very heavy. The bird song classification, that software is extraordinarily heavy. I guess there are birds in the desert, right? Maybe like a roadrunner or something. <laughs> I'm unfortunately going to have to uh, drop off here. Um, yeah, so I'll talk to you all later. Uh, oh, wow. Yeah, I should also. <laughs> yeah. We got carried away. <laughs> all right. Oh, well, let's save this. Uh, Eric, can you do that? Oh, uh, yes. Yeah. Yes, but Eric, thanks, thank you, you, Joshua, because uh, that's uh, very interesting. You feel uh, progress now? Yeah. Yes. Um, it's a safe too, right? This uh, this menu, and after what do I share the link? Or what 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 did we do last week? I don't uh, we shared it on the room page. I think you put it there, right? So I save to disk, and I put on the room page, or just the link? Uh, I think you. I think it, the, it was both. You did both, so you can just share the link. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Because so. I got here from the link. Yeah. The perma link, yeah, okay. because we could download it and then start editing it on a new one, right? Or how does this work? I thought that. There yeah, was... if you import the downloaded file, it works then. But then it's a different session. The session is not shared. Oh. That makes sense, I suppose. Yeah. Okay, so right. I will put. I put the link. Uh, I, I so I put the link. Okay, so sorry. sorry. I, I will ask on Discord after. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Bye. Bye bye. Bye. Okay, bye bye. Thank you.